there comes a time where you have to appreciate where God fed you during the famine. But be willing to leave and go back to the place where you really belong. You know how I said this was like a lifeline? You've convinced yourself that you can never have it. You've convinced yourself that you can never be happy. And you quote Bible verses. God wants you to be holy, not happy. That's in the first version of you. That's not a Bible verse. That's the book of your dumb cousin's opinion. You ever read that? Now, in case this seems like a stretch to compare us to this woman, let me tell you a little bit more about her story. Um, She wasn't really looking to get something from God. She was looking to give something to God. She had a, um, well, you can go watch the sermon online. I preached it to Holly called Just the Two of Us. I preached it in the whole empty room. It was just her on the front row and a few people that snuck in the back. But it was just the two of us. And I used it to talk about this woman and her husband. Did y'all hear this sermon yet? It was the most awkward sermon I ever preached because it was just two of us in the room. It was a very big room. And this, this woman was just determined to use what she had for God, really expecting nothing in return. Now, when I say timing your testimony, and I use these examples about taking the mic away and all of this. What I really mean by timing your testimony is about trusting God to obey him before he has shown you exactly why he's calling you to do it. Okay. Like it's really easy to say after the fact that God connected this and that and the other. And, right, right. But the trick of it is that she made a room for the prophet to come and stay before she knew what God was going to do through her act of obedience. And isn't that the hardest thing? Like the author said, to believe in advance what will only make sense in reverse. That's the hardest thing in the world. To let down the nets for the catch before you have any clue that this carpenter knows where they are. That's the hard part. And after she did that, the prophet said, you've gone to all this trouble for us. Now what can we do for you? She had something in her heart that she wanted God to do. Like, like you have something in your heart that you want God to do. A freedom that you want to experience. A gift that you want to see God develop. A greater state of meaning than just survival. She had it in her heart. But she had learned how to hide it. And when the prophet said, what can I do for you? <laughs> the woman said, I have a home among my own people. Because she did then. What she didn't have was a son. And the Bible tells us her husband was old. I told you, God has terrible timing. He waits till this man is shriveled up. Can I say it like that? And he brought her what she had stopped asking for. It was so painful for her to consider the potential that it could be any different that she said, stop messing with me. Do not mislead your servant, man of God. And she pushed away the promise of God. She pushed away the promise of God. She pushed away the possibility of something different. She pushed away. That's that's what you've been doing. To everything that God has been sending into your life to mature you and restore you. She is pushing away the very thing that came from the mouth of the one that she made a room for. She is pushing away the promise that God has sent her. But God did it anyway. The prophet looked at her and said, about this time next year, you will hold a son in your arms. (laughs) And she did. And she did. There is no record that she believed it. There is no record that she had faith for it. There is no record that she all of a sudden came into a scripture quotation phase of her study, did a Bible, Beth, more Bible study on pillars of faith. There is no record of that, but she held a son. And one day, 
unexpected to her, that son died. Unexpectedly. So let's recap. I didn't ask you for a son. You gave it to me anyway. And then you let it die. She takes the boy. Can I tell you the story? This is such a great story. Brings the boy. Puts it on the bed of the prophet. She went to Ikea and picked this bed out herself. Put it together herself. And she said, I'm going to put this back on the place that you were laying when you told me God would give it to me. And Elisha restored the boy to life. (laughs) That boy is the boy that's standing in the king's court. At least seven years later in 2 Kings 8. The boy that she didn't ask God to give her. The boy that died even after God gave the boy to her and came back to life. And what got me about this text was realizing that the thing that died in one season of her life was the thing that stood beside her in the moment of her greatest need. So, so you got to imagine it. Gehazi is the servant of Elisha. And the king calls Gehazi and says, tell me some stories about Elisha. And Gehazi has many. Well, there was one time, one time, he took his cloak and he struck the Jordan with it. And the waters parted. And the people were waiting to see, is he really a man of God? And the waters parted. And then one time, there was a spring in the town and the water was poisonous. But Elisha put some salt in the water and he purified it. And he said, your water will never be cursed again and you can drink from it. And then, well, one time, there were these boys who called him Baldy. And he called some bears out of the woods to mom. But let's skip that one. <laughs> you know, you're such selective stories. One time, there was... This, uh, there was this confederation of kings and, and they were in the middle of a drought and Elisha came out to him. He said, I don't even want to talk to you because you follow the wicked gods of your ancestors. And if I didn't have respect for Jehoshaphat, I wouldn't even speak to you. But now bring me a minstrel. And the minstrel started playing and Elisha started prophesying in the dry valley. And he told him, dig your own ditches and prepare for the rain that you can't see. And the rain came from a direction that it wasn't expected. It didn't come from the sky like normal rain does. It came from somewhere else. It's just the way Elisha was. And you can picture Gehazi. He's getting fired up telling these stories. You know, he He's remembering. He's rehearsing the things that God did in a previous season. He's rehearsing the things that God did in a previous season. Because one time we went to this widow's house and she had a little bit of oil and she thought she had no oil. But Elisha told her, go back and check the thing that you called nothing again. Because what you call nothing is exactly what God needs to do something that you. So, so he's telling the stories, right? And there's, there's one that he skipped with, with Naaman. Because Naaman was a leper who came to be healed. And when Elisha pronounced healing over him by dipping seven times in the Jordan, which is a ridiculous thing to do because the Jordan is a little dirty body of water. And Naaman was a great commander. And he could have bathed in the waters of uh, Abna and Farfar. Far, but he had to come all the way to the prophet and dip in the Jordan seven times for his flesh to be restored like a young boy. And he was so excited about his miracle that he tried to give uh, some gifts to Elisha. And Elisha said, I don't want your gifts. I didn't do it for that. And Gehazi chased down Naaman and said, uh, hey, my master changed his mind. So whatever you have, I'll take it back to him. And he kept it for himself. And Elisha, the man of God, knew about it. And he called him out. And Gehazi had leprosy. So what's he doing in the court of the king? A leper can't be in the court of the king. It looks like the little boy isn't the only one that God restored. I have to put this in. Because if I don't, you'll think that only if you're like the woman. And you do what God told you to do. That you can ask God to restore what you lost. But Gehazi is standing in the presence of the king. Watch this. To let you know that even if you did it, even if it was your fault, even if it was your selfishness, even if you were the one who let go, even if it was your irresponsibility, you can stand in the presence of God under the blood of Jesus and say, I want it back. In the name of Jesus, 
I want back everything that shame stripped from me and stole from me and took from me. So he's telling her the stories. He's telling the king the stories. And he gets to the one about the woman. And she built us a room. And she put a bed in it. And she didn't have a son. And Elisha said, you're going to have a son. And she's like, I don't even want a son. I've given up on it. And Elisha prophesied the son. And she shows up pregnant. And then the kid dies. And he's in the field. And he starts screaming about his head. And then they put him on the bed. And, and I was going to go try to heal him with my staff. But Elisha said, no, this is a job for me. And he came in. And I don't know what he did in that room. Because it was just him and the boy in there. But they both came out. As he is talking, the woman walks in the room. Do you understand the statistical improbability that at the exact moment there are so many stories to be told about Elisha? I didn't even give you half of them, but God knew the exact moment. That Gehazi would be talking about that woman. I don't know if she hit traffic on the way so that she was late. Or whether she caught every green light so that she got there right on time. But I have learned something about God. You can trust his timing. You can give him the mic. You can let him speak what he wants to speak over your life. And in the appointed time, it will come to pass. I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it in my own life that God knows exactly what, who, where, when. What? Oh, this is the best scripture. Do y'all want the best scripture in the Bible? Here's the best scripture in the Bible. Psalm 139. Now, this is the best scripture today. I'll have a different one tomorrow. But this is the best scripture I've ever read in my life right now. Okay? Because God will give you a certain word at a certain time. Here's what he gave me. Here's what he gave me, boy. You ready? Psalm 139, 125. I know that 125 doesn't sound like a verse number, but it is. There's, a, there's 125 in this verse. And I'm, I'm glad I took time to find it because it said something really powerful to me. I am thy servant. Give me understanding that I may know thy testimonies. Here's the, the part that hit me. Hold on before I read it. Who is this for? It is time for the Lord to work. Not for me. For thee. And I want you to come into the presence of the king. Not the king of Israel. I want you to come into the presence of the king. The Lord told me to tell you. It's time for him. To work. It's time. You've done everything you can do about it. You have manipulated it so much that you've messed it up even worse. There comes a time where Holly tells us, get out of the kitchen. You are not helping. And I heard the Lord saying to somebody, get out of the kitchen. And let me work. It is time for thee, O Lord, to work. For they have made void thy law. It is time for thee to do something about what they did. This woman left a homeowner. And while she was gone, surviving the famine, somebody else took her home. The king said, go back to Second Kings chapter 8. This is so anointed. I can barely, I can barely get it out of my mouth. There's so much jumping up in my spirit while I preach to you. Because the Lord said, this is a lifeline for somebody. It is time for thee, O Lord, to work. She comes into the presence of the king to ask back for what she lost. 
when she left. At the exact moment that she walks in, Gehazi was telling the king her story. Does God not have the craziest timing? And Gehazi said, that's that woman. The one who put the table and the lamp and the bed in the room. The one who gave us a place to stay. That's her. The one whose son Elisha restored to life. And there's the boy. Now you have got to drag what God did in your past into the room. And show the thing that you are facing today what God did for you yesterday. That's what you got to do. It is time for you to work, Lord. So just like you gave me this back, I need that back. Just like you restored this that I thought was gone forever. And God did that for me. There are some things that I know that I know that I don't have to prove it to you. You don't have to agree with it. God did that for me. Nobody else. It wasn't a human. God might have used somebody. But only God could bring the dead back to life. So the God who did this, I need him to do that. And verse 6 says something very interesting. This is the last verse I want to give you. Because the king asked the woman about it and she told him. And then, read it again. She told him what God had done for her. And then he assigned an official to her case. So she only got back what she needed when she told the story of what God had done. You follow the sequence? She could have told herself any story. Life isn't fair. This isn't right. I tried to obey God and now look at me. But she told the story of what God had done. And and so, so God wants to know, why have you stopped telling the story? Not to others, to yourself. Why have you stopped telling the story of what I did for you and replaced it with a story of fear of what might happen next? So while you are telling yourself these hypothetical stories of what might happen or these shameful stories of what did happen, you are standing next to a story, a living, breathing, walking, talking miracle, a product of nothing but the grace of God. That's why April Carter told me, she said, God did this for me. And I said, well, why didn't he do that? And she said, "Uh, in all fairness, it's not your story. (laughs) See, she never stopped telling herself the story. You stop telling yourself the story of God's faithfulness. And you start telling yourself the story of fear. She told him. What God had done. And then, everybody say then in the chat. I'm telling you right now, that one word, or let me give you another word, yet. Yet. I don't have it yet. I haven't found a way to get set free from this yet. I don't see how it's going to work out yet. See, timing your testimony. Don't tell it too early. Because you don't know what God is going to do in chapter 8. See, It's like the timing of God is so amazing. And every time you tell yourself a story about the, the things that God did then. And you bring it into the presence of what you need him to do now. He said, give her back what belongs to her. Say it out loud. Peace belongs to me. me. I am a child of God. God. Joy belongs to me. me. I am a child of God. God. Freedom is my inheritance. inheritance. I am a child of God. I I belong Because I believe I am a child of God. Tell yourself that story. 
Preach the gospel to yourself. If Gehazi can re- re- rehearse the great things that God has done, who was a leper and a scoundrel, can't you? And can you trust God's timing enough to give him the mic and believe what he speaks? That though the vision tarry, wait for it, for it has an appointed time. It's taking me a while to understand that God's timing is created to increase my trust in him. Whether that's the fourth watch of the night or whether that's the fourth day after I have lost something that I love. And God gives you these little gifts. What are yours? Have you told anybody that part of your story? Or are you so consumed with your present struggle that you have stopped rehearsing your past victories? Hey, thank you for watching. Make sure you subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream. And share this video with a friend. And don't forget, you can join me live every Sunday. Thanks again for watching.